Welcome to CPAC Now, America Uncancelled. I'm Mercedes Schlapp, and my better half, Matt, well, he's on assignment today, so he's not joining me. But tonight on the show, we've got two great guests, Town Hall reporter Julio Rosas on the border crisis and Ian Pryor on the uprising in Loudoun County, Virginia, over the school board's leftist agenda. Both will be with us in Dallas for CPAC Texas and CPAC National. It's July 9th through the 11th. But first, tonight, the border crisis. Julio, it's great to have you on the show. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me. Okay. So were you shocked today when finally the vice president, Kamala Harris, said, okay, I'm doing this. She's going to the U.S.-Mexico border? Uh, A little bit. But I mean, of course, you know, it's kind of hard to not note the fact that she is all of a sudden after 90 days of being appointed this kind of immigration problem solver that she's making the trip to El Paso right before former President Trump is about to make his own trip down to the border there. So uh, I'll give her props. She, you know, she's finally going and, you know, it's hard to deny that there isn't a crisis if you see it firsthand. And so that's why I think it's a good thing that she's going. Um, however, it's also interesting to note that she's going to El Paso and instead of kind of the more harder hit areas like the Rio Grande Valley, uh, Del Rio, Laredo, or even some parts of Arizona. So explain to our viewers why uh, you're thinking, OK, she picks El Paso, El Paso versus a Rio Grande Valley or those areas, as you were mentioning. So a lot of the. Uh, notably Democrats that live in and around the border that have been critical of Harris not visiting the border have been in those areas like uh, like Del Rio or the Rio Grande Valley, which has like McAllen, La Jolla, Hidalgo. Uh, and so uh, the the congresswoman who represents El Paso and that, that whole district, she actually has not been as uh, outspoken about the need for Harris to visit. Uh, and so uh, that, that's, that's number one, it's just kind of the political posturing right. about that. Uh, num- number two, and this is just just a fact, the uh, El Paso, the El Paso sector uh, has much of the border wall system uh, uh, completed. There is some pockets where, where it's not. But uh, when compared to places like the Rio Grande Valley sector, where, I mean, they're not even like 10 percent done with what was contracted out before President Biden halted the border wall construction. And so it's actually a lot easier for people to cross into the United States where there isn't a wall. Uh, like in the Rio Grande Valley, as opposed to the El Paso sector, which has much of the wall uh, already built and and completed. So you brought up a a good point, which is the fact that we know that President Trump, and this was over a week ago, announced that he was going to be going to the border with Governor Abbott. And of course, uh, President Trump made the mention, if Governor Abbott and I weren't going there next week, she would have never gone and uh, do you think that it was because or partly because of the pressure? I mean, she's been receiving an enormous amount of pressure, not only from Republicans, but certain Democrats as well. But also the fact that President Trump would have uh, beat her to it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think that him visiting the border was, was definitely a contributing factor. I mean, and also just the fact that her trip to the northern tribal countries and Mexico most recently, I mean, that, that whole trip was just a disaster because it was completely overshadowed by the fact that she was specifically avoiding the, the U S Southern border. And obviously, you know, the the whole reason why they they don't want anybody of that high ranking to go down there is just because, like I said before, it's hard to deny that there is a crisis there when you're actually seeing the effects firsthand. And what I always say is that if hundreds of people were crossing, uh, you know, the neighborhoods of Navy yard or Arlington, Virginia, this 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 wouldn't be a problem, but because it's happening in these small border towns that are insignificant and out of the media bubbles and the you know DC bubble, uh, they can just kind of try to ignore it, and because you know it doesn't really affect them at first. And so, uh, no, I definitely think that it would have just looked even worse if uh, Vice President Harris visited the border after President Trump. Look, I think it's going to be bad for her either way, Julio. I, you know, because at the end of the day, unless the liberal media decides not to cover President Trump, you know, this is one area that we know that during his presidency, he was solid, strong, and really was able to control uh, the border crisis uh, during his presidency. That obviously is not what we're seeing right now. Now, you're headed to the border next week. 
Uh, you've been, you've gone several, how many times have you gone? You've been down to the border, Julio? Uh, just this year, I think, oh, I think close to 10 times and so, in all, all different parts. Okay. So what have you seen? In, in the sense, like, you know how normally during the year uh, it, it it changes, right? They, summertime, usually there's less of a flow of individuals coming through the border. What do, what do, Those times that you've been down there, what have you seen? So I've been covering the border since 2018. I, I, I've made trips down there uh, when, it, when it was under President Trump. And look, I can say that it, it has just really, really uh, devolved in the situation there just because the, the difference, obviously, under this this current administration is that by saying that they're not going to deport unaccompanied minors or in even some family units, what do you think is going to happen? People are going to start to come, that they're being incentivized to take this very dangerous journey. And so uh, that, you know, President Trump wasn't <laughs> doing that. He was telling people to not come for, I mean, that's what he campaigned on, right? Right. And so... And so now, uh, now, I mean, the, you know, the migrants aren't dumb. They know that Democrats are more receptive and more welcoming of, of, of immigrants. So that's why they're more willing to take that risk and pay the cartels that thousands of dollars per head to, to go ahead. And so I, I would say that it's very, very depressing to see uh, when you have little kids uh, uh, coming up to Border Patrol by themselves, uh, when you have families and pregnant women, and also just because of the fact that they are uh, abused by the human smugglers and the cartels that facilitate uh, th th their traveling. So, uh, I mean, the fact that they like to say that they're, the Biden administration is taking a humane approach to, to immigration is just absolutely not true at all, because I do not see what is humane about uh, parents voluntarily separating themselves from their kids and then sending them on this very dangerous north. And of course, you know, that that's if they make it, because it's very common for, for kids especially to just disappear uh, in, into, right. you know, who, into who knows what. So it's very depressing to see that just because you know that they are being incentivized and being taken advantage of by, by the Biden administration. Yeah. And it's inhumane when you're allowing for sex traffickers as well, uh, to be also in charge of many of the youth that are coming over. And it is inhumane when you have women and girls being sexually assaulted as they're taking that dangerous journey throughout the border. And all you hear from uh, Kamala and Joe are, don't come, don't come. And yet they have not put any enforcements in place uh, to stop this chaos at the border. But we have seen Governor Greg Abbott uh, really take an initiative and say, I'm gonna invest. We're gonna put in uh, over $250 million down at the border. Obviously we know that that will only do so much and there's gonna be issues because the federal government is in charge of the border. Uh, what's your take on Governor uh, Abbott's actions? No, I, I think he's done. I think he's done a great job. I, most recently, when I was down at the border, I was embedded with the Texas Highway Patrol. Uh, They're down there as part of Operation Lone Star and seeing firsthand on, on what Texas is doing, and and it, it is great. And I, I've talked to some residents down at the border who have been very grateful. Uh, for Abbott taking kind of that strong approach. But unfortunately, you're right, because as well, they do want to build those barriers. A lot of times it's on federal land. You know, the border is right, it's federal land, so they're not right. going to be able to build there. And so, uh, but at least he's doing something, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, all, along with uh, the Arizona, governor of Arizona, you know, he, he's also taken more proactive steps than, right. say, California or New Mexico. Uh, but so it, it's, I think, you know, they're doing as best as they can. It's better than doing nothing, but it, it, this is the job of the federal government. But because Border Patrol is so overwhelmed, I mean, I, I know a lot of Border Patrol agents and they do a great work under the current circumstances, but they can only do so much when they have literally thousands of people in just their own sector each and every day. So, um, you know, Governor Abbott has done a pretty good job. And, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens with when it comes to Texas uh, wall that they're going to want to build. Right. And we've also seen other governors uh, wanting to help, including Governor Ron DeSantis, the Governor Ricketts from Nebraska, all saying we'll provide the resources and personnel down to help out at the border, which I think just shows the leadership of so many of these Republican governors. But Julio, just I, go down to the border, come back safely, and we want to have you back on the show. Your insight is so incredible, so important for the American people to understand what's happening down there. Where can people follow you? Where can they get your stories? 
Uh, so uh, I'm, a, as you said before, I'm a senior writer over at Town Hall. They can become a VIP subscriber. Uh, that money goes towards funding trips to, <laughs> to like to the border or to riots, um, what have you. So they can support my work through that way. They can follow me on Twitter uh, at Julio underscore Rosas11. That's perfect, Julio. Thank you so much for joining us. And don't worry, we won't let the left try to suspend you or take you down in any way. You have our support here at CPAC and the American Conservative Union, and we appreciate the great work that you're doing and, uh, and keep fighting and keep exposing uh, the failures of what's happening with the Biden administration and their lack of, of support in terms of the border. Thanks for being with us. Thanks. I'll see you all in Dallas. Emotions are high in Loudoun County. Uh, especially here in Virginia, where the, you see the school indoctrination of our students. Uh, and what we witnessed, at least yesterday, was a rambunctious uh, Loudoun County School Board meeting. And joining us today to talk about the events in Loudoun County is Ian Pryor, someone who has been a leader on this issue of fighting for our schools, on ensuring that uh, our children are not indoctrinated by this leftist agenda. Ian is senior counsel for Unsilenced Majority and the executive director of fightforschools.com. Ian, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So you have really been in the at the epicenter of what is going on in our school districts, especially when it comes to this radicalized leftist agenda that is being pushed by the school board's basically across the country, but with a real big focus on Loudoun County. What is happening in our school districts? Well, you know, I tell you, I think that, and I've said this out in, in speeches and events, we parents have really dropped the ball for years. I mean, this, this kind of thing has been going on under our very noses and a combination of apathy, distraction, you know, paying attention to things at the national level and neglecting things at the local level. But then you get the pandemic and the pandemic really started to wake parents up. And out here in Loudoun County, you had, you know, dozens of dedicated parents that would go to school board meetings every every two weeks trying to get schools reopened. But then you also had a, a different set of parents that were going out and saying, listen, you know, here's what we're seeing through through distance learning. We're seeing these lessons, these materials talking about, you know, white privilege and the, you know, meritocracy and equality for all perpetuates racism. And parents are, you know, what is going on? So, you, so they started going to the school board meetings and it really started to grow. And then we hit March and March was really the inflection point out here in Loudoun County, because that's when you had these six school board members that were part of this private Facebook group, you know, making a quorum and in that in that group, one of the school board members called for, you know, pushing back on the parents that were opposed to critical race theory. And then you had a bunch of people, you know, you had one person saying we need to infiltrate these groups. We need to publicly expose them, hack their websites and redirect them to pro critical race theory websites and then raise money for the operation. And then you had a laundry list, dozens of parents whose names, area of residence, school board reps were all dropped in there by these by these activists in this private Facebook group. No, no one in the school board did anything to shut it down. No one in the school board has ever put out a statement saying, you know, I disavow that group. I, I didn't realize what was going on. They just let it happen. And that really galvanized, I think, because they weren't just going after people that were opposed to critical race theory. They were also going after people that wanted to open schools. So you kind of created this coalition of really two different sets of parents that said, you know, enough is enough with this school board. And so we started our, our recall campaign and, you know, we were going along at a steady pace. And then they put Tanner Cross on administrative leave for speaking out at a school board meeting on the uh, proposed transgender policy. And then the floodgates just opened up. And, and it seems like every two weeks there's a school board meeting, the school board steps in it. They do something that is just so tenured. Um, and ignoring of, you know, ignorant of what the parents' will is here or refusing to work with them, that the coalition just keeps growing. It, it truly is remarkable. And I was sharing with you, Ian, you really, it's amazing what you've been able to do in organizing so many parents. And I think it's been quite a, an organic movement uh, to a certain extent. And it just keeps growing and growing in Loudoun County. And I think you all are such an incredible example of what other school districts and how parents can get involved in this fight to stop this indoctrination. 
let's uh, go back to the Loughton, Loughton, Loughton County School Board meeting that happened yesterday. There obviously tensions were high. I think you were uh, with about 30 parents walk knocking door to door, going door to door uh, in one of the areas where one of the school board members resides. Uh, walk us through what you learned, what you saw uh, at this school board meeting. Yeah, so you know, early on last week, we got you know we saw a tweet from the local Democratic Party out here that you know contained a link with uh, a donation platform where they were going to bus people in to the school board meeting. Now they had the time when well, we thought they had the time wrong. It said 3:30 on Tuesday, and we're like, oh, they got the time wrong. Oh, but they didn't get the time wrong because while usually it's a 6:30 meeting, con conveniently the school board moved it to four on Thursday of last week, and then they opened up public comment signups a day early. So lo and behold, a bunch of people that you know on the school board side were able to sign up in a row. So the first you know 15, 17 speakers uh, were, were pro school board. And so, you know, we said, all right, well, we're going to go out there and we're going to we're going to split our forces a little bit and we'll have people go to the school board meeting. And then we're going to have a bunch of people going out door to door to see how close we can get to the threshold for one of the school board members who's been, there, you know, particularly toxic. And, you know, as this meeting was going on and we're going door to door, we're watching it on our phones to see who's speaking, what they're talking about. We're collecting signatures from people and they're like, oh, is that the, is that the school board meeting? And, you know, we're meeting with the, all these people watching the school board meeting. As and I can tell you that for the most part, when we knock on doors, you know, if it's between their home, there's a large contingent of people that just say, oh, is that the, is that the school board petition? Yeah, give me that. Give me that. I've been waiting to sign this thing. So the, let's talk about this recall petition uh, to remove these school board members. Is there a deadline in getting the amount of signatures? How does that process work? And what can parents do in Loudoun County uh, to make sure that they sign this petition? Yeah, so it, in Virginia, it's very different than in other states. So, so, for example, in California, you have to go through certain processes and then you have a timeline where you have to collect the signatures. And if you're able to do it, you get a special election. In Virginia, it's actually a legal process. So you need to collect 10 percent of the total vote from the last election for each school board member. Then you have to file the petitions in court and you have to, you know, they have to have violated something in the removal statute. And in this case, it's neglect of duty, abuse of office, incompetence in the performance of their duties. Um, so that's gonna be a process once we get there. And we've got six of these school board members, so it's gonna be a lengthy process we, we expect. Um, as far as how to sign the petition, you know, go to fightforschools.com, um, sign up for emails and let us know that you know, you're interested. We will get people out to you. I can tell you that after the school board, after the school board meeting yesterday, we got over 150 emails within two hours asking where they can sign the petition. So let me ask you, do you have to be in Loudoun County to sign these petitions or anyone in Virginia or how does that work? You have to be a Loudoun County registered voter and specific okay, so to the district. Specific to? So there's, there are five school board districts. And there's okay. one at large. So anyone in Loudoun County can sign for the at large. But then as far as the individual districts, it has to be someone that resides in that district. So yesterday, it seemed that the Loudoun County School Board, they made this decision to just basically stop, right? They they cut off the public comment period Tuesday night. Then after that, they, they're holding on, on moving forward on any of this transgender agenda. Uh, where, where do you expect this to go next? Well, I, you know, I think it's interesting. We watched the, the school board resume and, you know, there's a back and forth between one of the school board members, Beth Bartz, who's, you know, really out there. She's the, really the toxic one. And another one, Jeff Morse, and he really, he kind of gave it to her. She said, we're not concerned with the safety of our students. That's not our job. And he just laid into her. And, you know, he made a compelling case that, hey, listen, if you're going to pass this thing, then we need to ensure that we have protocols in place to ensure the safety and respect all students, not just a small percentage of students. So you know, right. I, think, I think some people were encouraged to hear that for once, that one school board member was stepping up and saying, you know, it's not gonna be all your way or the highway. So uh, we know that Tanner Cross, he was the one that was suspended, correct? Uh, correct. For not using specific pronouns. A judge ordered, the Loudoun County Public Schools to reinstate Cross, saying that the school system's action was unconstitutional. School system is actually, is said it will appeal to Virginia's Supreme 
Court. Uh, where where will this end for Tanner Cross? You know, I think the Supreme Court is going to uphold this decision. I mean, the fact of the matter is when he went out and spoke, it was at a public comment session for the school board where they invited public comment. He went and spoke on his own time as a resident of Loudoun County. And for them to then put him on administrative leave for that reason, uh, the court, the circuit court, you know, really ripped into Loudoun County Public Schools and, and in fact called their action vindictive. I would expect the Supreme Court is going to uphold this and he'll he'll be fine. Yeah, I really think that it's the abuse of the school board uh, in suppressing free speech and in uh, taking retaliation against uh, uh, Tanner Cross. Just I want to get one quick uh, response on critical race theory. Is that it, it, is the school board going to bring those issues up? How is that going to be handled next? Well, that's a good question. You know, the critical race theory in Loudoun County Public Schools has actually been going on since about April or May of 2009 when they hired this consulting firm called the Equity Collaborative. You know, now it's it's so interesting to hear the superintendent say, hey, we don't teach critical race theory. Well, nobody's ever saying you teach critical race theory 101, but we have documented evidence from the last superintendent saying, yeah, our teacher trainings and our student instruction do align with critical race theory. We've got two school board members on opposite ends of the political um, divide, both saying, yes, critical race theory does inform what we're doing in Loudoun County Public Schools. And then you've got this equity collaborative that, you know, they're charging them, they're invoicing them for critical race theory training. The whole model of, of teacher training in their own documents talks about critical race theory as a framework for how they train teachers. So, you know, part of the problem here with this school board and what I think is is really um, creating anger around critical race theory is not just the fact that we know it's, it's present in the schools, but they just won't be honest about it. So it's difficult to have a debate with somebody that keeps lying about it. So, Ian, if if I'm a parent that lives in a different state but I really want to support your efforts or I want to be able to do the same thing in my state and my school district, where, where do they go? Sure. Well, you know, if they want to support our efforts, they can go to fightforschools.com. You know, any amount of donation is going to help our efforts. But as far as putting up your own sort of organization to do this, you know, the three words I talk about are investigate, communicate and activate. Investigate, you know, talk to other parents, find out what what their kids are learning. Talk to your, your kids, find out what they're learning. Send FOIAs to the schools. Look for words like equity, culturally responsive learning. Uh, you're never going to find straight up critical race theory. Find out who their consultants are how much they're paying them, what they've been hired to do. Uh, communicate, I mean, it's really about, and we've seen it here, you know, it, I've got obviously contacts with the press because that's what I do, but now we have all these different parents who are speaking to the media. So I don't even have to get involved with half of this anymore. I, you know, I see some of these parents, I'm like, oh, you just got quoted in, you know, this story, or wow, I, you talked to that reporter. So getting it out there, we, you know, through letters to the editor at first, or building email lists to the press and making sure they know what's going on, and then activating. You know, you're not always going to have a, a Loudoun County school board that, you know, violates um, open meetings law, First Amendment, Constitution with private Facebook groups. So you, you really have to figure out what your strategy is. Are there lawsuits? Um, is there a recall action that, that can proceed without having to go through um, the court system? But it's really developing a strategy to, to make change and, and go through those three processes. Well, those parents are grassroots heroes. Ian, I can't even tell you, you're just amazing. The work that you're doing and your leadership is, I think, inspirational for all of us. And as you know, one thing about CPAC is that our, our activists, they get involved, they speak up, they're unafraid. And, uh, and so we really appreciate the great work that you're doing. Thank you for joining us today. Stay with us. And now for some good news, you know, because we always need a little good news here and there. Uh, really for us here at the CPAC family, it is the countdown to CPAC Texas. Yes, that is right, ladies and gentlemen, 16 days and counting. And let me tell you something, our team is working day and night to make it the best national conference that you've been to in, uh, in a long time. Because we're going to have amazing, amazing speakers, including, of course, President Donald Trump. And I will warn you that it will be for the closing. So and he likes to speak a little late in the afternoon. So just be prepared for that. 
And uh, we've also got Governor Greg Abbott, Governor Christy Nome, uh, Governor Bob Lee as well, Ambassador Rick Grinnell. Uh, we've got Julio Ros Rosas, who we just spoke to, Dana Lash, uh, Representative Roger Williams. The list goes on and on. Senator Marsha Blackburn, I can't even tell you. It's just such a great group of patriots. We want you to be there, so go to conservative.org. If you have not gotten your tickets, these tickets will sell out. Remember, this is a national conference. People are coming from across the country uh, because it's time for us to be together. We can't stop working, okay? Because these liberals, these leftists are keep are gonna keep pushing critical race theory. They're gonna try to get rid of the filibuster. They are on their game and we gotta beat them. And that's why it's an important moment for conservatives to come together, make sure we have a plan of action so that you can go back to your communities and make a difference and stand bold and speak loudly. So I want to thank you so much for joining us. I know we're missing Matt today. He's just incredibly busy, couldn't be with us. But remember to follow this show and show your support by sharing with your family and friends and let them know about CPAC Now, America Uncanceled. I got to tell you, our programming is amazing. It's growing every day. We are so, so humbled and to be able to spend our time with you and talk about the news of the day and what we need to do uh, to stop the socialists and these communists in this country. So remember to follow us on our social media channels, including at CPAC, at M Schlapp, at Mercedes Schlapp. Uh, plus, we want to hear your feedback on the show and send us pictures. You never know. It could pop up on the show as well. Thanks for watching. Good night and God bless.